Well, let me say again, good morning. And welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I also want to welcome all those that will be joining us online and pointing at that camera right there. We're glad that you joined us today. Now, if, 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 if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the Gospel of John? Yeah, of course, we're going to be back in John, right? And we're going to be looking at John 15. And this morning we're going to begin in verse 1. John 15, and we're going to begin in verse 1. But before we begin, let me ask for some help from on high, okay? Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now, and we come to you uh, with, with an open heart, with an open mind. We want to hear from you today. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would pour your spirit out on this place, that you would speak to each one of us in, an, in, your, in the way that you do, in the unique way you do. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear from you today, that, Lord, you would speak through me uh, as your vessel, that it would be not my words, but your words. And, Lord, I just pray that we would really get a grasp of this, of this passage uh, so that we can further dig in as we go further into what it means to abide in you. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for what you're going to do today. And Lord, we're going to give you glory for all you do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so this morning, we're going to study the 15th chapter of John. And I believe, okay, this is just my own personal belief. I believe that this is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. But, but it is also one of the more difficult chapters of the Bible to understand. Because there are different ways that this passage or these passages can be interpreted and and interpreted wrongly right and i for one am really excited to come to the 15th uh, chapter of john okay i'm always excited right i mean come on can i i'll have an amen, amen. <laughs> all right now see you see when i was first called into ministry 27 years ago it, it is this this has been a life verse chapter for me i mean my life verse is in this chapter and and that is uh john 15 5 which says i am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him shall bear much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing not a zip right and i know that i know that there's nothing that i can do without god's grace and so uh i can do nothing of of eternal value at least so as you see i've been eagerly waiting for this 15th chapter to come along okay I'm a rather excitable person anyway. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. And I think it's going to be one of the most exciting chapters that we've actually studied together. Um, uh, I'm also excited about what the Holy Spirit has taught me as I was studying this again. Uh, as, I, as I got into this chapter again and again. And, and how it helped me grow closer to the Lord through these years. Uh, so I think that God was really going to move in mighty ways. In the, over the next few weeks, he's just, uh, you know, and because of what he teaches in this chapter, it's an amazing chapter. So we're really looking at an introduction to this chapter 15. There's some things, like I said, I want you to get right. That way you, you're not going to be stumbling over those things as we move on through chapter 15. So this morning we're only going to be looking at that introduction to chapter 15, first two or three verses. That's all I'm going to get. But even though it's only two or three verses, I want you to know that there's so much truth in this passage, in just this passage, in just the beginning of this passage, that it would be a miracle if we could actually get through all of the things. I'm not even dumping all of the things that, that I could dump on you, you know. So this is a very important chapter when it comes to walking a walk with the Lord. And it's a difficult passage, but one of the most profound and important ones in the Bible. And so we can't ignore this passage. Okay, so your homework after today is going to be to go home, read John 15 through at least through the 17th verse and read John 15 uh, and just go on down through the 17th verse and just read it and read it and read it and read it. And, read it. and you wait until you start. It starts sinking in. It's you'll you'll know what I know. Uh, so. You know, it is one of the one of the one of the most important books in the Bible, and and but a lot of people ignore it. Honestly, a lot of people just go zipping right past these first few verses, and uh, and they just make a few casual comments without giving it much thought. 
but we're going to make an effort to look into this carefully. Um, I always want to do this for you guys because, you know, you're not going to get this anywhere else. Uh, you could get it from, you know, seriously sitting down and reading commentaries, but why not get it from your pastor, right? Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, you'll see that this is also one of Jesus' greater, uh, the, the great I am sort of statements, right? This is the last of them. Uh, we discussed many of them. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. Um, and now we're coming to I am the vine. And, and again, we see the words I am, you know, that ego am I is, means is the same words that God used from the burning bush. So this has to do with deity. This has to do with, with God's name and referring to Jesus Christ's deity. Now, <clears throat> these verses all the way through verse 17 form a basis for Christian living. In fact, I'm maybe prejudiced, but I believe that this passage is probably the greatest passage in the New Testament on living the Christian life. Uh, and you say, Pastor Mike, come on. We got the epistles. The epistles tell us how to live the Christian life. Well, I think that's found in the epistles. But, but contrary to popular belief, the concepts that we're going to discover in this chapter are the ones that are clarified in the epistles. But the key concepts are right here. Uh, the concept of abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ, for example, is present in this passage. The concept of bearing fruit as a believer, um, and, and it, that is in this, in this passage. And these are the basic principles of the Christian life. Abiding in Christ and bearing fruit. The epistles then become definitive. I mean, they actually define what's being laid out as a groundwork here when Jesus makes this statement. So, so like I said, I may be prejudiced, but I, I really think it kind of all boils back to Jesus' words. But for now, we're just going to start with the most basic way to understand the different parts of this analogy. And, and it is, it's an analogy. It's, it's, it's pointing out this is like this, right? You know, so um, the branches and the person who takes care of the vine called the vine dresser, that's, that's in this. That's all a natural part of it. But the key to the passage is the discussion of the branches themselves. Okay, uh, so we're going to be studying that, this, some of that this morning. Okay, are you ready to go? Okay. Now, there's two groups of branches in this passage, and I'll give you an introduction and then I'm going to explain it. There's fruit-bearing branches in this passage, and you notice how if, you, if you've got your Bible open, you can look at the end of verse 2, it mentions branches that bear fruit. And then if you jump down to verse 8, you'll, you'll see it mentions bear, branches that bear fruit. So that's one category. Then there's also branches that do not bear fruit, which are mentioned in verse 2 also. And beginning uh, and the beginning of the of the verse uh, at the beginning of the verse and then there's another mention of the branches that do not bear fruit in verse 6 so if you're looking at your Bible you'll see these okay now the question that arises is this and let me say that the fruit branches fruit bearing branches are clearly I don't think I really need to tell you this but they are clearly Christians if, if you're bearing fruit you're a Christian but, but who are the branches that don't bear fruit? This is where a lot of the interpretive issues come in, depending on people's different theology. Uh, and uh, so are the branches that don't bear fruit, are they Christian or non-Christian? Uh, because the problem arises when the branches that do not bear fruit are thrown into the fire, okay, and burned. What would, it, would that mean that if, if, if it is Christians, uh, does it mean that Christians could perish, or does it mean, does it imply that Christians are chastised for not failing to bear fruit? Or maybe is it possible that you could lose your salvation if you don't bear fruit? Those are the difficult questions that arise from this passage, and those are the ones that are kind of nagging in your head if you don't talk about them in the beginning. So I want us to know for sure, based on what the Bible says, who these branches are. And I believe it'll be as clear as the Spirit of God intended it to be. I believe he's going to speak to each one of you in the, in the area that you need him to speak to you. Um, 
you know, if we look at this faithfully and connect it to other, the rest of the God's word, when you take it out of context is where all the problems come. So I'm sure that the, the, by the time we're done this morning, you're going to know what the answer to this problem is. Okay, I'm sure about that. And I hope that you're going to be able to see it in the light of God's word as we look at every aspect of this together. Okay. Now you're going to recall that this is the night again. I got to put you in context. So this is the night again where Jesus is still. It, he had just finished the upper room discourse, and and it's the night before his death. He's going to the cross tomorrow. Uh, so he's speaking with his disciples, and I, and I examined the context of this passage over and over again to try to get into Jesus' head. What is he thinking? What is he thinking at this time? Do you ever do that? I hope you do. When you read the Bible, you want to, you want to ask yourself questions like, what is Jesus thinking when he's getting ready to say this? What is he seeing when he is getting ready to say this? Um, so I examined it in its context and over and over and again to try to determine what Jesus was thinking. But why does he seemingly jump from let's get up and from the table to this analogy? What causes him to do that? What is he thinking about that, that, that he would give this statement or the statements that he's going to give? Well, we know that Jesus has been giving them his upper room discourse, and we, which is his final speech. You know, it started in 13 and worked its way all the way through chapter 14. So why does Jesus suddenly begin an analogy or a parable about a vine dresser and a vine vineyard and branches? Why is that? What's the reason for that? What's going on? Well, there's just a little hint in the last part of chapter 14 when Jesus says to his disciples, at the very last, last verse, verse 31, he says, Rise, let us go from here. Okay, so now we can imagine that Jesus and the disciples, they have gotten up from the table, and they're, they're in the Jerusalem, and they had the Passover meal in this upper room, so they're filing down from the upper room and in chapter 14, and Jesus told them, now it's time for us to get up and get going, so they get going. That's Mike's paraphrase, right? <laughs> so, so we believe that Jesus is talking to his disciples as they are walking in chapters 15 and 16, because in chapter 17, they've already arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he gets arrested in chapter 18. So, between chapters 15 and 16, there's some travel time going on through the Kidron Valley and up the other side, headed towards towards the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I believe that, that, that uh, by Jesus' thoughts of that night, that, that they were about what was going around him uh, right then with his disciples. I believe his thoughts were mainly, because remember, we gotta keep this in his context. It's going, what he's thinking about is the small group of people he was with that night. I mean, and this is, you remember who he was with. That night, there was a lot going on. But he was there with his 11 disciples, his 11 remaining disciples, and he knew all 11 of those men, and he spent the whole 14th chapter comforting them. Amen? And we dug into that. And then he was aware of the Father because he knew he would be separated from God the Father the next day. He knew that was coming. When he took the sin of the world upon himself, he knew he was going to be separated from God for the first time in all of eternity. Um, he was also aware of another man, his name was Judas, who had been one of the twelve now who had been sent off and dismissed from the group, and he told him that he, what he was going to do. He knew, he said, go and do what you're going to do, and he knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to go out, he was going to sell him off, it was going to be a done deal, and, and that was going to start the, the plot for him to be arrested. Betrayal. That's Judas. So I believe that in Jesus' mind, he was bringing all of the characters from this final night drama into focus in this passage. I believe that he saw in his mind's eye, he saw the 11 disciples who he deeply and passionately loved and, the, and who loved him back in return. And I believe he saw his father who he loved in an infinite love and the father loved him infinitely in return. Then I also believe that he saw Judas whom he loved with that same infinite love, but who did not love him back. These were the characters in this final drama. 
So as we begin to look at the 15th chapter, our key to the chapter is determining who, what he is referring to here. Most likely, <clears throat> this refers to the same characters in this unfolding drama. So I believe, I'm going to submit this to you, I believe, after much study, that the vine is Christ. Probably have no, no problem with that. The vine dresser is the Father, God the Father, and the branches that bear fruit are the 11 real disciples that are the genuine disciples that are following him, and any others like you and me who are trying to follow Jesus every single day of our lives. Um, all the way through the church age, all the believers through the church age. And the branches that don't bear fruit are the Judas branches who were never real to begin with. Okay, remember they're the ones that have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. Remember what he said in John 13, 10, where Jesus said, Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed, remember when he was doing their feet? You know, uh, and Peter, Peter, he, he you know, <laughs> Peter, he says, no, you're not going to you give me a bath, right? And, then, and Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to, to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. In other words, what Jesus is saying to them there is that once you've been saved, once you've been cleaned, you only need your feet washed from time to time, right? We're going to stumble and fall, we're going to get dirty, right? In other words, once you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you don't have to get saved all over again. That's not a thing, right? All you need, is, you, don't, you don't need another bath. All you need is a dusting off, a little dusting off every day. And that's the continuing forgiveness of God that we read in 1 John 1, 9. It says, uh, and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, so, but then you look at, in verse 10 at the very end, he says, and you are clean. You see this? And he's referring to his disciples. And you're probably wondering, why is he talking about this? Oh, you, you're going to learn. <laughs> I'll get to it. Then he qualifies it in verse 11 by saying, but not every one of you. You're clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not all of you are clean. So I believe that Jesus knows the difference between his own disciples who are clean, but not all, because one of them is unclean. Jesus then, then considers the obvious contrast between Judas and the eleven, and I believe he carries this on into this chapter. And I think that's the contrast that he's carrying into this vine and branches analogy in chapter 15. At that moment when Judas is about to betray him, it's obvious that the, that the Son of God is thinking about it. It's obvious, and I think the branches are going to fit nicely into these categories when we look at this passage in more detail. Both groups knew Jesus well. You got that? Both of them knew Jesus well. He was, he was with the 11 disciples who were faithful, and he was with the unfaithful Judas. They were with him for the same amount of time. It seemed like everything was going well. And he, you know what? Judas was even given the responsibility of handling, handling the, the purse strings, the money bag. But Judas was a branch that looked like a vine, but it never bore fruit. God cut that branch off in the end, and it, and it, and it, and it burned, and is still burning today in hell. Some people would come along and say, well, I guess that means that Judas lost his salvation. Must be. And, and I guess that means that if you don't bear fruit, you can lose your salvation. Do you see where the problems can rise in this? I hope that I don't need to spend much time on this, okay? Because I hope I've hammered it before concerning this line of thought, since it clearly contradicts so many scriptures, okay? After all, eternal life is eternal. Does that make sense? When Jesus gives you eternal life, it's for how long? Eternity, yes, yes, okay, so eternal life is eternal. In John 6, 39 and 40, he says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, 
that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. He didn't say, he didn't say temporary life. I will raise Him up on the last day. Do you see that? The Word of God absolutely clearly is absolutely clear about eternal security. Uh, in John 10, 28, 29, Jesus said of the sheep, I give them what? Eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. There's no one that can snatch you, snatch you out of Christ's hand. Therefore, we realize he can't be speaking of a true believer who stops bearing fruit. He can't be. And loses his salvation. And, 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 and who would be consigned to hell? Instead, he's referring to this Judas branch. When he's talking about this, he's re referring to the Judas branch, which appears to be in the vine and belongs to it superficially, but was never real because the branch never produced any fruit at all. Judas had a superficial relationship with Jesus Christ, but he walked away. He had a relationship, but he walked away. He voluntarily ended that relationship, and what, what he was and what he was willing to do actually became a judicial uh, thing on the part of God. God then judged him. So it makes sense to me that on that this is on Christ's mind, and that at the end of this his discourse with his eleven disciples, that he would bring them together. Uh, all bring all of their relationships together in this one analogy that he's doing. Uh, so now remember when he talks about the branches that don't bear fruit and cut off and, and are burned, he is talking about people like Jews. Okay, I want you to remember that. Even now, there are people that are like that that are close to Jesus, but they've turned away from Him. Maybe they've been they've turned apostate and are doomed to spend eternity apart from him. There are people who go through the through religious motions. Maybe they go to church. Maybe they believe in some kind of connection with Jesus Christ, but, but they're not really true believers. They have never really surrendered their life to him and asked for forgiveness of sins. And again, it seems natural to me that the branches that do bear fruit are the 11 disciples and others like them who truly abide in Christ and show it by the fruit that they bear. This is also a frequent contrast in the Gospel of John. We've seen this over and over again, haven't we? Where Jesus is taking, uh, uh, showing us what a true disciple is and what a false disciple is. He does that throughout the Gospel, and, and this follows the exact same pattern. So using this as an introduction to chapter 15, let's look at the text and elaborate on, on just some of the, the same ideas that, that we've been talking about. And I'd like to go over these, these two or three verses and the identities of these characters, the vine, the vine dresser, and the branches. And they're all terms used to describe the vine. Okay, so the first is true vine. True vine, and that true vine is Jesus. Jesus says to the eleven, I am the true vine. And they're moving, okay? So that's as far as we're going to go. No, <laughs> that's it right now. Uh, we're going to stop right there. Now, with that statement, he has so much in it to begin with, it's extremely frustrating to try and condense it for the time that we're going to be together. He says, I am the true vine. Okay, so let's give you a little lesson. The vine in the Old Testament, the vine that God spoke about, it was Israel. Israel was God's vine. But they were an empty vine, as Israel, as Ezekiel calls them. And they were a degenerate vine, as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all talk about Israel as a degenerate vine. In other words, a vine that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And so there would be a new vine as Psalm 80 says, listen to this. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, have regard for this vine. He's talking about Israel, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you, whom you made strong for yourself. God planted a new vine in the place of Israel, and that new vine is Jesus Christ. That's the new one. So so that there would be a new vine, the Son of Man. So he comes along and he says, I am 
the true vine, as opposed to a false vine. Who is the false vine? Israel. Israel didn't do the. He's saying that that before his coming, God's life was poured through Israel. And formerly, the connection with Israel brought the blessing of God, but that is done with now. Israel has forfeited its right to be divine, but Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, in the end times, Israel is going to move back into that position, but where the church will, will be out of there. Now, it's interesting that he chose a vine to represent himself, when you think about it. Uh, it's interesting that he chose vine, and I think he does for a variety of reasons. I think that he wants to demonstrate many things by referring to himself as a vine, maybe lowliness, but a vine is planted in the ground. How, low, how much lower can you get? And Christ certainly came in the form of a man, and as this says, he was planted here. That's what the that's what it says, which your right hand planted. It's just like just like thinking of Jesus as as a as a vine. Um, I think it also represents a union. A union, the vine and the branches. There's there's no more intimate union that that, that we can see in in uh, in in our 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 world. And you look around and you say, well, if a branch is attached to a vine, it's getting all of its nourishment from that vine. You can't get much closer than that. You can't. Branches are completely dependent on the vine. It demonstrates dependency. I, be I believe the illustration is a classic example of fruit bearing, demonstrating how, how the branch bears fruit, but not, not by itself. It doesn't do it by itself. You know, there's no branches. Have you ever seen branches just laying around without being connected to a vine, and, 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 and they've, got, they've got all sorts of fruit on them? You don't see it. Just cut, a, cut a branch off a vine and watch what happens. It'll wither and die. So we're going to go over that later. But I think the vine is a perfect illustration of many, many relationships. It's a great illustration for belonging. For example, nothing belongs more than a branch to the vine. Nothing. Nothing. For all of its resources, it's totally dependent. Completely dependent. So Jesus chose a vine to represent himself. Then he tells them, he, he told them, I am the true vine. Now I've got to, I've already said that in the Old Testament that Israel was God's vine. That is, God worked through Israel. He worked through Israel. God was the vine dresser of Israel. And Israel was the vine. Israel was dressed by him. He cared for Israel all through the Old Testament. You look at it. He cared for Israel. He pruned, you know, he's still doing it today. He prunes Israel. He works with Israel. He, he, um, he cut off and cast aside the branches of Israel. That were not bearing fruit and israel's connection to god as god's covenant people brought blessings blessings of course faith played a big part and that's clear but that is what brought salvation and being a jew was a great blessing in itself so israel was god's vine in the old testament and god's vine has always been israel israel but israel had become an empty vine an empty vine and there was no there was now a new vine that was coming on the scene it was no longer through a covenant relationship with Israel that man received blessing nor was it being connected with God's promises to Israel but who was the new vine it was Christ Jesus and now in order for a man to know life or a woman to know life to know fruit in his life, we must be connected to Jesus Christ because he is the true vine. Perhaps that's what Paul meant when, when he says in Colossians 2 7 that we are rooted and built up in him. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus your Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Perhaps he sees Christ as the vine there. Paul did. So, so Christ is the true vine, and in the same way that he was the true light. Remember when he, was, when he said, I am the light of the world? 
He, he is the true vine. Remember how Christ is described as, a, as the true light in John 1? We looked at that right in the very beginning. God has previously revealed his light many times, but Christ is the perfect revelation of that light. Perfect revelation. Everything that can be conceived in the spiritual concept of spiritual light is conceived in Jesus Christ. In contrast to human or earthly light, physical light, and believers who are the light of the world, Christ is the highest and most lofty of all lights. He is the essence of light in the spiritual sense, and it just got me to thinking, you know, even in the end times, all the way up into the, the eternal kingdom, the, we aren't going to have a sun anymore. Our light is going to be Jesus. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So Israel was the vine of the Old Testament, and Christ was the true vine, a perfect representation of a vine. It is the kind of interesting, it's kind of interesting as you study this. I mean, I think it's interesting. As you study the Old Testament, you study Israel as the vine, you're going to notice that every time Israel is mentioned as the vine, it's always mentioned as a degenerate vine. He may have said, this was my plan for you, but then it's always, well, you just aren't doing it. You aren't doing it. The vine is never mentioned in the Old Testament apart from being degenerate. But in contrast, Jesus Christ is the true vine, and guess what? He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I know which vine I want to be connected to. Amen? Amen. All right, let's look at the vine dresser. That's number two, the vine dresser. I am the true vine, he says, and my father is the vine dresser. Now you get where I understand where the father, where the father is the vine dresser, right? Christ now sees himself as the vine, but he sees the father as a person. You think about that. He's saying, I'm a plant, and father, my father is a person. That's kind of an interesting thought. He's emphasizing the father's care for the son and those who are of the Son, the branches that are, that are mentioned in this passage. As a result, he sees the Son as the vine and, and the Father as the caretaker of the vine and its branches. It's, it's an amazing relationship. It's, it's the care of the Father for his own Son and for those who his Son, who are his sons by faith. All right, now notice, we have the word vine dresser. What is a vine dresser? Well, this is a person who looked after the vine, and he was an agricultural work, worker who looked after the vineyard. Okay, now, anybody have experience growing wine? Or grapes? <laughs> yeah, growing wine. Yeah. <laughs> grapes, okay, so we got some, we got some experience. Because the only thing that I know is what I've read, you know, I mean, and, and all, the only thing I know about farming and vines and how they work and other things is what I've actually read. So here it is. Aside from the preparation of the ground, which, which the, the, the vine, vine dresser did, he helped prepare the ground and the planting of the vine. The vine dresser had two major responsibilities. His, he, he was first responsible for two things in relation to this vine. He was in charge of cutting off the branches that bore no fruit because they were sapping energy from and from the fruit bearing branches and they needed to be removed so that fruit would grow on the other branches and the energy would not be dissipated from that branch to the other to the other branches that, because they don't have the capacity to bear fruit. The second thing the vine dresser did constantly was to prune the branches that did bear fruit. That meant cutting off little shoots and other things so that the branches didn't waste any energy and, and could focus on bearing more fruit. Am I have it right so far? All right, it's good. It's good. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, that's verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You see, you see that at the end of verse 2? Did you notice that? He prunes it so it can do what? Bear more fruit. And in verse 8, he says that he wants it to bear not just more fruit. He says he wants to bear much fruit, right? By this the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. 
and so prove to be my disciples. So we're going to bear fruit. We're going to bear more fruit. And then we're going to bear much fruit, right? So the idea was the person who uh, who took care, it's the person that who, took, who took care of the vine, they cut off and got rid of all the branches that didn't produce fruit. And incidentally, vine branches are literally useless for anything else. I mean, they're not they're not they're not good for burning in a fire. Uh, so they're so they're thrown away and they're consumed. They don't even burn well uh, enough to be functional from everything that I've read. Is that true? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, so far, my sources are good. Uh, so they would throw they would throw them away. They get rid of get rid of them because they were sucking energy from the other branches that needed that energy. They had to, they had to be pruned back. They had to prune back the branches uh, that had already been produced, that had already produced fruit, so that they would produce more fruit. Do any of us like to be pruned? I don't like to be pruned. Now we're gonna get into that in a little bit, but you, you'll notice that the work of the Father is outlined in verse two. The Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he does what? He takes it away. He takes it away. Here's the first thing the Father do, does. He takes away the, the, the things that are not bearing fruit. The Father's first ministry, ministry to this vine is one of punishment. It's a hard one to hear. The branch that does not bear fruit is cut off by the Father and he gets rid of it. It doesn't say that he fixes it. It doesn't say that he nurses it back to hell, but he gets rid of it. In verse 5, it says, If anyone does not abide with me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's something we're going to talk about later, too. These issues are taken care of once and for all. This is, this is the end. When God takes care of it, they are cut off, and that's it. Now, if this is about a Christian, then we have real problems which we're going to see in just a minute. I think what's taking place here is that every person who says they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who seems to be a follower, who is this Judas type of branch, who's never been saved, is apparent that they've never been saved because they don't bear fruit. Um, that, and, and really, that is the dead giveaway. Someone says they belong to Jesus, you see zero fruit in their life, then you might want to have them reconsider. Um, at a certain time, the Father cuts that off so that the vine and the branches can live and stay healthy, and he is thrown away. This is the first thing the Father has to do, cast away the so-called Christians who aren't really saved, and it's obvious that they aren't because they don't bear fruit. The Father's second work is also mentioned in verse 2. It says further down, every branch that does bear fruit and now this is the second work. The second work is he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. So the Father really has two ministries to the branches, removing those that do not bear fruit and pruning those that do. Everyone we see that is a true Christian is in view here. Every fruit-bearing branch behind that, there must be a true believer. With every fruit bearing branch, there's a true believer. Isn't it interesting that the Father has some work to do on Christians as well? I mean, he not only takes away the ones that, that don't belong, uh, but he's also he's also taking us and he's pruning us. And, and it's not a final work, you know, we are a work in progress. But it, 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 it's a continuing work, it's a never ending pruning. I don't know about you, but I get pruned every day. Um, and I'll explain how that works in just a little bit. So, but the idea is that when the Father prunes a fruit-bearing branch, He does so in order so that that branch would bear much fruit, and eventually much fruit. So we have the Father's two duties, remove the branch that bears no fruit, and prune the others. Okay, now let's look at the vine branches, and we're only going to look at this real short, because next week I'm going to really get into these vine branches. 
Now, so the third point is the vine branches, and this is gonna this is gonna prove to be the key. As I said, there's two kinds of branches. Get this. I want you to get this in your head. The vines, the vine branches are are now. Let's just look. Let's, let's say you look at your vine, vine you know, your, your your vine, and you say, mm, this thing is flourishing. It's growing rapidly. Uh, there's lots of leaves. It looks great. So it's it's you look at it and it's getting tall too, heavy. Yeah. So the, it's drastic pruning is needed. And then a careful vine dresser who wants to be who wants to have a fruitful vine, he must cut and remove those fruitless branches for the sake of the vine's health. And 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 the and the, and the and the product, which is the fruit, the grain. He also must carefully prune away all the little shoots and other things that cling to the fruit bearing vine that will sap its strength. Now, when a vine was planted, and, and this may still be true, but back when a vine was planted in those days, when a vine was planted for three years, it was never allowed to bear fruit. For three years, it was pruned back and not allowed to bear fruit. Each year, it was drastically pruned back so that it might acquire strength and might acquire energy. And by the fourth year, it was ready to bear fruit. As a matter of fact, it usually was busting loose, wanting to bear fruit. It was, it was bursting at the seams with fruit-bearing potential. It had been pruned and shaved so that it, when, it, when it came time to bear fruit, all of its energies would be built on, on producing the fruit. I want you to think about this. I didn't think about this when I was writing this, but this came to mind. How long were the disciples with Jesus? Three years. Okay. Three years, they weren't allowed to really go out and bear a lot of fruit. They'd been held back. But when Jesus left, what happened? The fruit started to just explode. How about Paul? How long did Paul spend in Arabia with, with, uh, with Jesus? Three years. Do you think that for three years that he had any fruit? Probably not, other than just being with Jesus and learning from Jesus. But afterward, wow. Can you think, you know, how God uses different things to, to bring our minds to different things in the Bible? Well, that just came to mind, so that's that's one of my wonders. <laughs> anyway, normally a mature vine was pruned, and it was usually done in December or January. Uh, the fruitful branches were pruned so that they could bear fruit. And you'll remember that Jesus said his followers are a lot like this. They're like the fruit-bearing branches that need to be pruned. Some of them are like branches that do not bear fruit and will eventually be cut down and burned. So let's look at those two branches, okay? Let's look at those two. First off, there's this one that says, I'm a branch. And every branch of me, he says, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, for several reasons, I believe this person is not a Christian. First and foremost, I believe it cannot be a Christian because I believe that fruit is present in every Christian's life. I do not believe you can be a Christian and not have some sort of fruit showing in your life. You say, you mean every Christian bears fruit? Yes, I do. I do. Every Christian bears fruit. Some Christians, you may have to look for hours, many days, to find yourself a couple of stray grapes, but you're going to find those stray grapes. You know? <laughs> Some Christians, you have to look a long time. The, the very essence of new life in Christ is productivity. The very essence of it. When, when Jesus comes into your life, there is a new life productivity in your life. No, now, now fruit can mean many things, but that's not our concern at this time. However, every Christian produces fruit. Every Christian. We know the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Okay. Thank you. I always, I always miss that one. Self-control. I wonder why. Selective, maybe. Ephesians 2.10. I want, I, you know, I want to support this with just a couple other passages. Ephesians 2.10. And this is really, I think, going to help be helpful to us. It says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for what? 
or good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To put this another way, the fruit of salvation is good works. One of the things that's going to happen in your life is your attitude's going to change towards other people. Your attitude's going to change. You're going to see a lost world and your heart's going to ache. You're, you're going to see somebody in need and you're going to want to meet that need because the Holy Spirit in you wants to do those things. So it is good works. For example, you have it in James, and I'm not going to read all read the whole thing, I'm just going to highlight it. It's mentioned several times in James, James chapter 2. For example, in verse 17 it says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have, have works, is dead. Dead. In other words, if it isn't, if, you, if, if your salvation, your quote unquote salvation is not, is not legitimate, um, it's not going to bear fruit. You're not going to see fruit. Every genuine faith is productive, even in, if only in the, in the slightest way, the most minor of ways. And he continues, he says, you see that faith was active, in verse 22, he says, you see that faith was active uh, along with his works, and, and faith was completed by his works. And while this does not imply that you're saved by works, I want you to know that you're not saved by works. We have Ephesians 2 that tells us that. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not, it's not of works. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. It doesn't imply that evidence, uh, it, it does, but this does imply that the evidence of your salvation will result in good works. Because God planned it before the foundation of time when you came to Christ, that you would be about his good works. And as a result, we can see that every believer, every truly saved person, bears fruit. Everyone who's been saved by grace through faith. Now, I want to show you a couple other passages before we stop for today. Because I do believe this is very important. In Matthew 7, we read some, some pretty important words from our Lord. Verse 16 says, you will recognize them by their what? Fruits, right? That becomes a definitive way for an individual to know that someone's a believer. You do know that when you examine someone's life, or you get close with somebody, you should be able to see fruit. The believer that bears no fruit um, is not a believer. The one who says that they're a believer and they bear no fruit. Because that's how you identify a Christian. That's what Jesus said. He said you will know them by their fruits. Uh, I, let's give you, I'm going to give you three examples out of Matthew. And there's a good reason for that because anytime Jesus says something three times, there's a good reason he's saying something three times. In Matthew 7, 16, he says, Are grapes gathered from the thorn bushes or figs from the thistles? Now watch this. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. How many good trees bring forth good fruit? How many? Everyone. Yeah, that's right. Every single one of them. There is no such thing as a believer that does not bring forth good fruit. Verse 20, he repeats it again. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Matthew 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You're known by your fruit. Then in chapter 3 of Matthew, again, it's repeated three times in the same book. Matthew 3, verse 7. But when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers. He had a way with words, didn't he? <laughs> you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Well, then he tells them how to live. He says, Bear fruit. Now watch this. In keeping with repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is turning from your sin and yourself. And he's telling these people, you can't get there on all those, uh, all the, all the ceremony and all the ritual and all the, all the. You can't do that. You need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and it starts with repentance for all of us. In other words, they are fruits that are connected with salvation. You see, salvation and fruit go together. And that's how you tell if somebody's saved. Romans 
For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things which which you are now ashamed? Well, the answer to that would be nothing, right? He says you were saved. What fruit did you have? The implied answer is none. I'm not ashamed. And, and if you did have any, it was the fruit of sin. If you had the fruit that you were ashamed of. And, and But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit that, that the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. That's Romans 6, 22. Every believer has everlasting life. And every believer has fruit, will bear fruit. That's what he says. There's no such thing as a Christian who does not bear fruit. None. All right, we're going to stop there. I could, I could go on more, but I'm going to stop right there because I just want you to, I want you to really grasp this. I, you know, we're going to, we're going to dig deep. Don't worry, it's all going to come together when I'm done, right? When I'm done, it's all going to come together, and you're going to be glad that we've gone through this laying of the foundation because if I, if I didn't do that, you, you might be scratching your head at some of the future verses that we're going to be talking about. So, and then we can then we can get into what it really means to abide in Christ, to remain in Christ. Okay, that's the question I got for you today. Are you abiding in Christ today? Is He truly your Savior and Lord? He came and He died and lived a. He, I mean, He came and He lived a perfect and sinless life, and He died on the cross so that he, so that you could be saved, so that you could too bear fruit. That's why He came. He rose again on the third day so that we could have eternal life, not temporary life. Remember, he said, I give them eternal life. And it's not, and it's not, not temporary. Because if we could do something, I just got to say this, because if we could do something to lose our salvation, it's a temporary life. And it's also by works. That wouldn't work. So are you by, is he your Savior, Lord? I hope and I pray that, that he is. But if not, even though I haven't even laid it out exactly how you can know Jesus, if you've got the desire in your heart to, to know him in a personal way, we're going to give an invitation in just a second. I'm going to go stand in the back. If you, if, you, uh, if you need Jesus, and you know you need Jesus because you have a tongue in your heart, and God gives it to you, uh, you just slip on back at the end. If you need to come back to Jesus and you have, you've been away for a while, that's a good time to do it too. I'm there to help you with whatever part of the spiritual journey you're on. And if there's more of you, then I'll grab that Pastor Eric and we'll both go back there, you know? So, and then if there's more, I'll grab Pastor Rick and grab Pastor Melvin. We'll get back there and we'll just have a whole bunch of people back there to pray with you, okay? All right. <laughs> Praise God. Let me pray for you.